on this Malebma Batua to continue the Australian Pharmacy Council's conversation on cultural safety in pharmacy education. Today I'm speaking to you from Larrakia country. Um, the AAPC is in Ngunnawal country and we will have speakers joining from Kabi Kabi, Bunjalung, Ghana, Irida, Wur Wurundjeri and Ngunnawal. On behalf of the APC and myself, I acknowledge that we're all meeting today on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land, and I pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that acknowledgement to any other Aboriginal people in this webinar. So my name is Alina, and I'm honoured to be your host today as we continue to reflect on the APC's literature review approaches to the implementation of cultural safety in the training and education of health professionals. And if anyone would like to read this, it is available on the APC's website. Today, we're looking at what's happening now so that we can better learn where to go. And today's insights will be an important contributor to setting the scene for future change. For this conversational journey, we'll be joined by Griffith University, UniSA, um, NAPSA, the National Australian Pharmacy Students Association and the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. So we're gonna take a trip around Australia. Um, and we're gonna hear what's happening now. And then there will be a QA and a session at the end. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll hopefully get to them towards the end of this discussion. So without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kerry Hall and Dr. Fiona Kelly, who are joining us from Griffith University um, to share what they're doing to embed cultural safety in the training of pharmacy students. Thanks, Selena. I'm Dr. Kerry Hall. I'm a lecturer with First Peoples Health at Griffith University as part of the First Peoples Health Unit. Um, I'm a cubic I'm, a, I'm coming to you today from Kabi Kabi country and I'm a Lama Lama and Kofi LNG woman from Farm of Queensland. I'm just waiting on Fiona to get the slide going. Can you see them? I can see them on my end. Yep, move, you can go. <laughs> Uh, I would like to, uh, so cultural safety, so for me, because I'm a nurse and an Aboriginal health practitioner with dual registration with APRA, cultural safety is determined by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander individuals, families and communities. Culturally safe practice is the ongoing critical reflection of health practitioner knowledge, skills, attitudes, practicing behaviours and power differentials and delivering safe, accessible and responsive healthcare free of racism. So at the First Peoples Health Unit, we're about embedding First Peoples knowledges to contribute towards closing the gap in health outcomes between First Peoples and other Australians. Um, our ethos is Bugle Bugula Myabrama, which is better wellbeing always. Um, one of the primary things that we do with students at Griffith is all students that are going to be registered with APRA before they go on placement have to do UI Wolfen, which means culturally able. And it aligns as a novice level with the, on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health curriculum framework. Um, well, meet, meet Mary. Mary is an Aboriginal, proud woman, Aboriginal woman married. She's a carer for her two grandkids, multiple chronic disease conditions. And this is just a video that we re recorded at Griffith for the Immerse project. And it's just about how to do culturally safe interactions. Hi Mary, how are you going today? Oh dear, get in there, it's been getting nowhere. Yeah, you don't <laughs> sound real well today. What's been going on since <clears throat> I saw you last week? I've been in hospital. Oh, okay. I've got a bit of a chest infection. That's no good. Oh. Yes. Back a bit. Yeah, so Mary, this is Michelle. I know um, before you, a yeah. couple of weeks ago, we spoke about you having problems with your medications and you wanted to sort it out. And mm. I signed mm. you up to the study and yeah, thanks. brought Michelle in. And now you've ended up in hospital. Like, to me, mm. you sound like you should still be there. What? Why are you oh, here today? No, no, I couldn't take it. Not one, not, not one more night. It was awful. 
had me in with all these men. Oh, that's no oh, good. And and one of them was one of them was he only had you know hours to go. He was oh, wrapped around. Oh, that's around terrible. I couldn't get me sleep, and yeah. I, it was depressing. And I felt yeah. like, I didn't. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry to hear that. I just had, couldn't get. I had to get out of there. Yeah. So when did you go home? Um, I got home day before yesterday. Okay. Okay. Mm. So you've come in today. Mm. So we're going to go through. Talk to Michelle yeah. about your meds today and a few other things that, that have been going on with okay. you. <clears throat> so part of this program is we normally have a, 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 an app, a tablet that we do this on, but I know you yeah. said last time you went real oh, keen no. on that technology oh, stuff. Yeah, I'm technology challenged. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't no really, gets away from and you don't really stuff. trust that stuff. So I don't, I don't know who's looking at my business. That's okay. <clears throat> so we're going to do it on paper. Today, Thank okay. you. I appreciate that. So we all have people in our lives, Mary, that make us strong and make mm. us keep going on when things are pretty tough. So mm. who are the some of the people in your life? <laughs> well, keep me strong or make hard work for me. Oh, <laughs> well, it, can both. Both. it can be both. It can be both. It can be both. No, my, my, my husband is wonderful, Brian. Yeah. Um, so that was just a little interaction um, and piano take. We're talking about the Stay Strong Plan. For you, for those who haven't heard about the Stay Strong Plan, it was developed by Menzies in the Northern Territory uh, along with the Black Dog Institute, the Royal Long Doctor Service, um, University of Sydney, and it was to facilitate culturally safe mental health services. Um, it was initially used in Queensland in incarcerated women as they were being ready to be released. And it's about forming collaborative partnerships to identify their strengths, discuss worries and set goals. It's a motivational interviewing self-managed problem solving tool and it's to also to help um, engage and build rapport between the client and the pharmacist. So from a pharmacy perspective, you know, this was developed, the app was brought into the Indigenous Medication Review Service or the Immersed Feasibility Study led by Professor Amanda Wheeler. And it was originally used in the pharmacist training and in their, develop, their delivery of the intervention or the medicines talk as part of that. And so it was introduced during a one day workshop following completion of an online module led by John Briggs, a Yorta Yorta man um, and from the Gunnai Nation and Kerry. And so as Kerry said, it was, it was introduced as a culturally safe tool to, as a conversation starter and focus on social wellbeing first and getting to know the person with you and reflecting also that collaborative relationship working with the Aboriginal health practitioner as the connection and the trusted connection with the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person that was in the medicines talk with the pharmacist, but also to reflect that two-way learning that recognised the expertise of all three parties in the interaction. And originally this, the training itself and the use of this app was piloted with the Master of Pharmacy students at the university and has since been incorporated into the Master of Pharmacy program. So, um, so <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, right. So related this to the pharmacy curriculum. So I, in first year, I do a lecture with the first year students about telling your story. Um, that's all around building rapport and trust with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. I do a brief overview of Aboriginal health and chronic disease. We talk about the community controlled health sector um, and effective, um, effective communication, sorry. And we also discuss you and whooping. At, and at the end of my lecture, all the students have to do you and whooping for the fit for placement. And then it's, it's scaffolded throughout the program. So there's a specific course in third year for first people's health practice and uh, selected placements in the Bachelor of Pharmacy program. And in the second year, MFARM, we build on their effective communication skills when they start to learn about motivational interviewing, which the Stage One Plan is partly built on, and they do that. And then they go off to placements in Wismo where they do the Cape Byron Walk with an Aracqua Elder, Delta K, and some other things at the Wismo Rural School. And we have some underlying curriculum tracking, but they don't tell us everything because we know that we've, we've got some strengths, but we've got some areas for improvement. So um, confirming strength. So at Griffith, the Occupational Therapy School, we developed a deadly, deadly curriculum working group. And through that, the, we've, it's been a two and a half, nearly a two year process. Um, COVID had an advantage with this, so it gave the, the conveners time to go away and think because we started this process at the start of last year. Um, we had discussions about what they want and how they could align to the curriculum framework. 
um, through that process, all the conveners and lecturers have been kept keeping reflective diaries on what they've learned. Um, they've just, the new curriculum has just been through the accreditation process. And from that, we've had a abstract accepted at the world, into the International Occupational Therapy Conference. So that's really exciting that we're able to embed those knowledges in a, into a curriculum at Griffith. And we plan to do that with the School of Pharmacy. Thank you. That's just part of our journey and, and we've got lots to do. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Carey and Dr. Fiona. We're now going to head um, over to Uni SA and I'd like to welcome Michael Watkins and Professor Deborah Rowett. All right, thank you uh, there. I'll just get my screen ready to share. All right, can everyone see that okay? Excellent. Um, thanks everyone. Of course, um, like to acknowledge um, country that we're, we're presenting from today down in Ghana, Yurta, Adelaide, Adelaide regions, um, Adelaide Plain region. Um, and we're gonna be talking about uni, a, bit of a bit of a partnership, I suppose, um, Deb, isn't it, between the UniSA's Department of Rural Health and the Pharmacy Program, and uh, I guess what contributions the UniSA UDRH has to um, not only our core nursing and allied health programs um, delivered out of City East, but uh, where we can bring our resources together to further strengthen, and I guess the theme of this topic is around the cultural safety within, within our programs. Um, I'll, yeah, a bit about myself, so I've, I've got a um, I'm the lecturer in Aboriginal Allied Health for UNISA's Department of Rural Health there um, through my father's way where mob or a jingly mob up from uh, the territory, sort of around Catherine area there, if anyone's familiar up that way. Uh, and Deb, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. And um, I, I'm um, the Professor and Discipline Leader for Pharmacy External Relations at UniSA and um, working with um, Associate Professor Sarah Jones and Michael um, in building up this interprofessional um, uh, rural experience. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Michael, to begin our session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Deb. Um, I, I wanted to to start on this slide, of course, you know, acknowledge country and all the various countries that everyone's linking in from today and um, all the other Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people joining in to this session and that you work with. But um, it, it, it's the slide I regularly use to get students to reflect upon, uh, particularly in the rural placement setting where they may be going to various um, countries and working with various communities. And I really want them to critically think and self-reflect upon well, one, how do we acknowledge meaningfully and why and what does it mean to them as an individual? And I think that's a part of uh, perhaps my sort of personal teaching pedagogy in this space. Um, you know, it's for some people, it's about reading that script off the piece of paper and standing up there, but I really want them to try and um, have a deeper connection and a deeper meaning towards that as well and, and what it might mean for them. So a quick insight into what the UDRH has to offer, not just to our pharmacy program, but across the other nursing allied health programs is around, um, like we said, we're starting this partnership around building and growing rural placement opportunities. And along with that comes unique learning opportunities. And one of them we're gonna to highlight today in particular, but all students, um, particularly who attend a placement up at one of our main um, teaching and learning sites in Wyala, uh, in rural South Australia, we'll attend an insight and a cultural responsiveness workshop there as well. Um, and then a pre-rural placement module as well. Sorry, it's just cut off there from the learning objective slide, but a pre-rural placement module. And um, I'd just like to, um, uh, I guess, uh, recognize the Griffith University Yuan Wupin pre-rural placement module there as well, which I think is really leading the way in the space in terms of addressing that larger question, how do we prepare students not only for practice, but before they graduate and before they go out and before they go on a, on not just a rural placement, but any placement. And then uh, rural placement students also have an opportunity to attend a, a video conferencing into professional learning uh, session around insight and the cultural safety there. So what we wanted to highlight today is that pretty much all students who undertake a rural placement in Wyala across the Port Augusta region, uh, We'll have an opportunity to attend a Wadna Yura cultural immersion trip up to Adnamatna country or Adnamatna Yatta up, up in the Flinders Ranges there and um, 
I'd like to recognise a colleague and, and local Adnamata fellow, Christian Coulthard, who runs this business and we've been working with for, for over uh, five or six years now as well. And uh, what's really unique about this trip, it's not just a trip out bush for students, you know, um, but it's really about that learning on and from country and building their cultural awareness. And, and I like to, um, before we head out there and, uh, and then when they come back, that critical reflection about, well, how does this contribute to, to them building their cultural capabilities? And that it's okay, you don't have to all get it in one day as well. Um, and that it's just to be up there, be immersed, um, and then reinforce that you learn at uni anyway about these self-reflective skills, the critical thinking, use that. It's not unique to this, to this uh, setting. Uh, and think about it the day after for the rest of the couple of weeks you're on a rural placement, the rest of your program and, and into your practice there. And again, what's really unique about this is learning about some Adnamatna Mura, social history, local history. And again, this is, uh, this is what Christian Coulthard delivers. So um, it's, a, it's, it's a real credit to his approach to teaching our uni students. And we've probably had Deb, um, anywhere from 60 to 80 students per year over the last five years go out as well. And, and um, we're undertaking an evaluation of that. So hopefully next year, we'll be able to share some information around what kind of impact this is having on preparing our students. And then we're undertaking some mapping of this work uh, against the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Curriculum Framework. But um, it's probably a yarn for another time, but you could imagine how difficult it might be to map something so, um, I guess, direct and, and constrained that the, uh, the framework brings to something like an on-country experience, because it's not, uh, it doesn't, just doesn't quite work that way. Uh, but Deb, I'll hand over to you uh, for the next few slides here, but this is just a uh, some pictures there, I'll leave with you, hand over. Thank you very much, um, Michael. And yeah, just um, sharing some of, and perhaps the next slide as well. Um, just wanted to share with you some of our experiences of learning on and from country, um, being led there by Michael and um, uh, Christian Coulthard there as we are heading out. Um, and the next slide, um, thanks. I think, um, what was really important was actually um, hearing the stories, learning, you know, and, and this really resonated with me as we stood um, at that, um, uh, I suppose, on country, you know, this really stood out that there was a lack of understanding of language and culture. Um, when, you know, and it was a communication barrier. And I think one of the parts of the, um, the pre-workshop before going out on country was about language, Michael, and how you shared, um, you know, with the students' language. And I know in talking with the students um, who attended that, that was really important um, as well to have an understanding. And this was a very, I think, great way to start our on-country experience. And next slide, thanks. And you know, it, it does have a lot more meaning as we, you know, learn uh, on country and from country. And it's not about a textbooks and um, a way of learning. And it was also an interprofessional activity. So we had podiatry students, physio students, both undergraduate and postgraduate students. And us as the clinical educators were there present learning and we were immersed in those stories as well. And so could reflect on those and share those with the students um, as part of that after the day um, and, and beyond as, as the rest of the elective unfolded. Thanks, next slide, Michael. And, you know, we shared and learned a lot on that um, experience and, um, you know, learning on country and from country, these are memorable experiences. And one of the really important learnings was also that sometimes you could walk past this area and not see the meaning until you had it explained to you by Christian. And, um, and, and I think he was also very able to relate it to the clinical context and the, and the healthcare setting that sometimes that also, you know, you know, to really be mindful and to listen more to talk less and to listen more um, and um, we were privileged to hear those stories and and the meaning of the the community at 
um, a place like um, Sacred Canyon where we were visiting on that day. So next slide. Um, so it was a great rural experience, Michael, and um, uh, some of the pharmacy students heading down um, that riverbed um, as we were heading towards Sacred Canyon. And now I might hand back to you in the interest of time. Take myself off mute. Thanks, thanks, Dev. Um, yeah, look, uh, what I will mention from here is uh, some opportunities to move forward. And, and I'm, I'm not a pharmacist by trade, but rather um, what I, I chair this group called the Aboriginal Strategy Group. And as I'm talking, you can see uh, who we represent and what our aims are. And I think what we have a group to offer, not only the pharmacy program, but also our um, various other nursing and allied health programs uh, is an opportunity to collaborate. Um, and I've seen you know, an emerging and a growing I guess, evidence base in terms of how, how do non-Aboriginal students, one, not only feel prepared to work in Aboriginal health, but also have an interest in it as well. And I think that's what's really unique about the on-country cultural immersion trip is that's building that, that awareness and that interest and, and that, um, you know, towards not only Aboriginal culture, but um, Aboriginal society today too. So to just wrap it up, I've got a few things which I think, um, what Deb and I, uh, on behalf of the DRH and, and uh, the pharmacy program, have an opportunity to go from here is around placement opportunities. Um, of course, in Aboriginal health settings across the board, but in particular, our focus will be around those rural placement opportunities as well. And then um, the various Aboriginal placement sites from there as well. Uh, but then also Aboriginal curriculum review projects. So uh, recently, our university undertook a, a university-wide un, uh, Aboriginal content undergraduate program review. Uh, and what we've done as an Aboriginal strategy group has taken the liberty to adapt those resources used to, to have a bit more of a, a ground up approach in terms of uh, getting some of our nursing allied health programs to, to undertake that review as well and use those resources. So uh, thanks, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to change pace a little bit here and we're going to head over to um, Melbourne and we're going to be joined by some pharmacy students. So I'd like to introduce you to Verity Bausted, who is the current NAPSA president, and Priyanka Maharaj, who is the Rural and Indigenous Chair for the 2021 period. So um, welcome, Priyanka and Verity. I have a couple of questions for you, if you don't mind me asking. Um, so I'll start with you, Priyanka, if that's okay. As the Rural and Indigenous Chair for NAPSA, I mean, how did you get there? What, what sparked your interest in this area and in cultural safety? Yeah, thanks, Selena. And that's a great question um, because for me personally, it was, it was really a bit of a aha moment, as we say. Um, I, I had grown up overseas um, in the Middle East and um, in that time I'd been very proud of my nationality as Australian and I was proud to say that I'm, I was an Australian person and you know part of that was knowing that we had the oldest surviving Indigenous culture um, mm -hmm. but uh, admittedly at the time you know I left when I was four years old and I didn't have an understanding of um, Australian history or really um, uh, our like relationship with the First Nations people. And so when I moved back to Australia um, in high school um, and we, our school did activities for Reconciliation Week, um, that was when I guess I learned all about Australian history, about all the atrocities that were committed and how recent they were. And the thing that really struck me was also how far behind we seemed in terms of giving back to our Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And that sort of, you know, shattered this uh, sense of identity that I'd built up um, growing up. And I think real, that realisation, um, I just felt like, you know, what can I do? And I realised that the least I can do is try and learn about the history and the culture mm -hmm. um, uh, and the role that I play um, in uh, cultural safety and starting to study pharmacy and learning about NAPSA and the stuff that we were doing, this position just seemed like the right way to move forward with that. 
I had a really similar experience overseas once where I told someone that I was Australian and they um, then made a comment, something along the lines of, oh, well, then you must be a racist or something. And that was another earth shattering moment for me. I was like, I didn't know that that's how we appeared to people on the outside. And I think these kind of moments stay with us and they can build up over time little bit by little bit so thank you for sharing um and now i'd like to shift to so what is napsa doing at the moment to address cultural safety for pharmacy students so as Priyanka said we've got the rural and indigenous chair which is quite a big portfolio in napsa and that is a role that we implemented over a decade mm -hmm. ago in response to recognising that we didn't have a subsection of NAPSA that represented rural and Indigenous health. And in order to address this gap and really fulfil that area um, and develop it more, we introduced the Rural and Indigenous Chair. And it's really enabled us to implement a number of new initiatives and address cultural safety for pharmacy students across Australia. Yeah, um, and like Verity is saying, just building on that, the stuff that we've gotten been able to get up to recently, um, apart from just being a voice for students on various organisations such as the CPA and RPA, um, we also try and bring cultural safety into the limelight for pharmacy students um, by posting throughout the year um, in regards to NADOC week and Reconciliation Week, um, just so that Indigenous health is in the forefront of students' minds. Um, and uh, one of the biggest things we've done and we want to continue doing is holding education sessions each year about Indigenous health, um, the largest of which so far was um, last August uh, in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, we had a, um, a webinar where we got to hear from three wonderful guest speakers who all had experience working in the Indigenous health sector. Um, many of you may know um, Chris Braithwaite, Mike Stevens, um, and also uh, Justina Heck, um, who, for anyone who's been following um, the series, spoke on um, the podcast back in September for conversation one of, of the series. So yeah, that was a really lovely experience. And um, we're also planning on hosting another similar event about cultural safety during our next NAPSA Congress. Um, so for any NAPSA members listening in, um, stay tuned for more information about that. Excellent. Um, and I guess that links on back to that was what drove a moment for you, Priyanka, was actually being at one of these education sessions and going through an education process. So excellent. What's the driving factor behind NAPS taking on this work? Is that, um, do you have any more details about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think it's quite prevalent that there is a really big um, gap between the life or in the life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And as pharmacists or any healthcare professionals, we have a really strong role to play in that. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a great influence in helping to overcome this and helping um, close that gap and to help improve the health outcomes of um, First Nations people. So one of the major reasons for this disparity in health is cultural safety. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned, pharmacists have such a pivotal role and an important role in building this. And we can start by doing this at the student level and helping yeah. train our pharmacy students to do this. And although it's integrated into the university curriculum, um, I think it's really important, or we as an organisation at NAPS, I think it's really important that we do um, educate students more comprehensively outside the university curriculum as well. And at NAPSA, we have the opportunity to provide some more education and understanding around cultural safety and awareness. Um, just one last quick question. Uh, from your perspective as students, where do you see this education sitting in the curriculum? Yeah, you know, um, Verity and I uh, 
talked a bit about this um, earlier. And one thing that's really lovely, I guess, being in this uh, webinar is hearing from um, the other from Griffith Uni and um, Uni SA. And a lot of the things that we thought were important about um, it that to introduce in um, in terms of cultural safety in the curriculum uh, sound like they've already started to be implemented. So things mm -hmm. like, you know, introducing it early in the degree and revisiting it multiple times throughout um, and also uh, providing those opportunities for more unconventional placements um, in regional areas or even in Aboriginal uh, community controlled health organizations, stuff like that, I think will really help um, students actually hear from Indigenous patients and practitioners, which really would be the best way to establish that cultural safety. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we're now going to shoot over to speak to Simon Blacker from the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. So I'll hand over to you, Simon. I think you might be on mute. Thanks, Elena. I uh, appreciate that. Apologies for the technical delay there. Um, uh, on behalf of the Pharmacy Guild, um, uh, thank you for including us today to be part of the discussion about embedding cultural safety uh, into training and education uh, for our industry, for pharmacists and, and, and the workforce. And really with that, uh, the community pharmacy as everyone who's working within the pharmacy sector. Um, I'm coming to you uh, from Ngunnawal country in Canberra. Um, my role uh, with the Guild is as the ACT uh, branch president. I also chair the subcommittee for community pharmacies for rural and Indigenous Australia. Uh, and, and it's pleasing to see Priyanka here as uh, one of our, Priyanka is one of our uh, subcommittee members and, and yeah, delightful to hear her speak uh, as with the other speakers as well. Um, with regards to uh, the, um, the plan, my apologies. There we go. Um, hearing uh, students and, and our educators speak uh, about um, what they're doing uh, with regard regarding um, embedding cultural safety within our profession, um, it's, it's obvious that the next generation uh, are having the education um, and, and, and awareness that will allow them to work um, effectively with Indigenous and First Nations people. Um, so the Pharmacy Guild as uh, the uh, National Organisation for Community Pharmacies then uh, needs to also demonstrate leadership uh, to the community pharmacy sector so that where uh, an industry can um, yeah, progress and, and make sure that we're embedding cultural safety in what we do every day. Uh, as part of that, uh, the Pharmacy Guild has uh, commenced on having a reconciliation action plan uh, to demonstrate our commitment uh, to, to this initiative and to, to lead the way for our sector. Um, as part of that, uh, we have uh, conducted um, cultural awareness training for all of our national secretariat staff, for our branch staff, and for national councillors such as myself. And that's our first step to, to uh, embracing reconciliation, and implementing our plan um, and, and uh, providing the way for the community pharmacy sector. Uh, within that, yeah, we want to uh, show ways to, to celebrate Indigenous culture, increase cultural awareness, uh, and provide opportunities uh, for creating partnerships with Indigenous organisations from a national level, but also empower community pharmacies all across Australia to do that as well. And, and, and to, if they're not sure how to start, certainly uh, the Pharmacy Guild uh, demonstrating leadership in this space should give them the confidence uh, to, to make the first step. Reconciliation is everybody's business, uh, and we want community pharmacies across Australia, uh, whether they are metropolitan, regional, rural, or remote, to feel that they are competent and capable of delivering um, culturally safe, safe services and provide a culturally safe space for, for Indigenous Australians all over Australia. I'll just, uh, we have our, um, our uh, Reconciliation Action Plan artwork on the screen uh, there, which is yeah, a vibrant um, uh, artwork which was created by Maggie Jean Douglas, 
who's a proud Gubby Gubby woman, and, and it tells the story of the Guild's healing journey towards reconciliation. I know uh, there are uh, plants reflected in the in the um, artwork, you know, with, uh, alluding to medicinal properties, and uh, very very proud that we have uh, this artwork. And with regards to our reconciliation action plan, it's currently with Reconciliation Australia, awaiting formal endorsement. So. Yeah, the Guild is itself on its own journey uh, as a leader in the sector. Other areas uh, that um, we are looking to embed uh, cultural safety is with regards to clinical governance. So the Guild's, um, uh, as a leader for community pharmacy, is um, committed to ensuring uh, that we provide a safe uh, and quality uh, outcome for every patient who comes in to our community pharmacy, regardless of where they are in Australia, and to, ne to, to ensure that we need a, a quality framework and good, good governance standards. Within the, the principle of uh, cultural safety and, and making sure that it is uh, prioritised, we have um, you know, noted that we need uh, all pharmacies to prioritise the health uh, outcomes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that they need to engage locally uh, and, and establish strong relationships uh, with local, their local community and organisations that are operating in that space. Um, it also encourages all pharmacies to, to think appropriately of co-design of services when they're looking to create um, a service or provide a new service within their pharmacy in the local community uh, and ensure that we're delivering uh, culturally safe care. One of the things that uh, Hannah Mann, who's one of uh, our subcommittee members of Cypria, uh, highlighted to me when I became a chair was the importance of uh, considering Indigenous Australians, not just in rural or remote areas where uh, it naturally uh, tends to be a starting point for some pharmacies, but that it's actually from metro, regional, rural and remote. So certainly um, the Pharmacy Guild in representing all pharmacies in that way um, is trying to uh, embed uh, clinical governance standards as a way of ensuring that we uh, uh, see um, a development and that improvement of cultural safety. With clinical governance comes a clinical governance framework and noted within the seventh community pharmacy agreement is the, the fact that um, the, the Guild is recognised as the custodian of the clinical governance framework for community pharmacy. Another role I have within um, the Pharmacy Guild is, is chairing our quality assurance program. And we've uh, certainly looked at mapping the clinical governance framework against the Australian Commission for Safety and, and, and Quality in Healthcare and ensuring that we have the right framework to ensure appropriate cl clinical governance to guarantee quality and safety. And that then reflects further in ensuring that we have uh, cultural safety embedded across all aspects of the community pharmacy operations. And on the screen in front of you, you have our Quality Care 2020 uh, framework for community pharmacy with its what we call our five domains. And, and cultural safety is embedded across all of these domains. Um, significantly, pharmacy management and governance. So decisions made to ensure that that pharmacy operates in its local community appropriately and, and, and consumer-centered care so that the, uh, the consumer or the patient is uh, at the center of any decision made so that we can um, better service our local community and in regard to cultural safety, making sure that we provide uh, an appropriate safe space and have uh, the appropriate education for our pharmacists and our, all of our staff working in the pharmacy to provide a, uh, an appropriate um, model of care locally. With regards to um, training, support and development, uh, the Pharmacy Guild um, has um, learning and development modules, which is uh, something there to, to assist uh, and, and highlight cultural awareness and safety. But I think, um, yeah, and Johnny Briggs has been mentioned uh, previously in our presentation today, the, the introduction of Johnny to do some work with the Pharmacy Guild, um, to me is a significant um, development and, and, and an ongoing relationship that that's part of creating that, that education piece for the Pharmacy Guild and thus for community pharmacies so that we can ensure that community pharmacies are willing to take the first step. And then once they've done that, that they are willing to, to continue to build relationships uh, and, and seek education at their stage of the journey. Yeah. With nearly 6,000 pharmacies across Australia in many, many different locations, there are many unique locations and, and unique communities. And 
the local community pharmacy needs to have the confidence to, to step into this space and, and embrace it and make sure that they are uh, doing that in conjunction with their local community so that uh, they can do it successfully and, and provide a better service for Indigenous patients wherever they are. And speaking of Johnny Briggs, um, as part of his engagement with the, the, the Pharmacy Guild on our journey, he has presented at the uh, APP conference the, the last three years as part of the Indigenous, or has headed up the Indigenous Wellness Forum. And um, Johnny has presented a cultural awareness training and workshop for the last three years. Um, and I must say, you know, personally, uh, having met and, and been part of um, Johnny's training, yeah, as a community pharmacist who um, has been in, in, in working in the industry for over 20 years, yeah, Johnny's training for me was, was a starting point of how do I do better to make sure that I embed cultural safety in pharmacies that I work in? And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a continuing journey for me. And I think I, I'm reflective of uh, perhaps that older generation of pharmacists that um, uh, are working in the industry and are not lucky enough to be receiving um, the education uh, and, and immersion that, that our previous speakers have spoken about uh, earlier in the presentation. Finally, just as an, ex uh, an example of where uh, the, the Pharmacy Guild is trying to ensure that uh, cultural safety is being embedded, the Indigenous Dose Administration Aid Program is a program that, that commenced as of 1st of July this year. With a, uh, it's a, it's a program where free dose administration aids are available to any Indigenous patient um, at no cost to them. Importantly, within the business rules of uh, that for a pharmacy to provide that service to Indigenous patients, they need to regularly participate in cultural competency training and liaise with local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and their organisations. That is a requirement of being part of that program. And that's an example of the Guild and the government and other stakeholders working together to ensure that community pharmacy uh, successfully uh, begins and continues on this journey so that they uh, can um, ensure that they're, they're looking after their local Indigenous community to the best of their ability. Finally, just a couple of examples of community pharmacy involvement. Um, we have a photo there of Lucy Walker and one of her other pharmacists from Bundawindi in southeast Queensland, uh, where they've, they've uh, engaged with uh, local Indigenous artists. And a, a special shout out to Kate's chemist in Townsville, who collaborated with Seed Foundation Australia. And, and Seed Foundation Australia are an organisation um, looking to grow the health workforce of Australia's first people um, via health career pathways. And they're, they're supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students to, to, from rural and remote communities to get involved in, in health professions. And, and we're very, very uh, pleased. And, and what I'd love to be able to, to show in later um, seminars such as this is further examples of community pharmacies uh, being more proactive in this space. Thanks, Elena. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for all of your presentations today. We're going to start a more of a dialogue now with some questions. Um, and I might start with you, Simon, if that's OK. Um, so bringing in all of this work and all of this training, um, what were any barriers or that you've come across along the way in making this happen? Yeah, Elaine, I think um, uh, my own personal experience would be an example of where uh, for a period of time, I lacked the confidence to, to make the first step. And by having, uh, in my case, the Guild um, provide an opportunity for me to um, have um, further education uh, and, and, and have a learning experience, um, it, it allowed me to, to, to be more confident to work in that space. And as a pharmacist, community pharmacist of over 20 years, yeah, that was a, a moment where I realised I needed to be more proactive and do more in that space. And I think... Um, you know, community pharmacists across Australia and their teams um, will be doing different things, um, but perhaps some will be um, lacking confidence to make that first step. So by the Guild showing leadership in this space, you know, we are a resource that, that pharmacies can call to ask. And I, I know of a pharmacy group that's, that's spoken to the Pharmacy Guild about creating their own reconciliation action plan as, as a pharmacy group of 50 pharmacies. So there, that, that's an example of, of uh, change coming through the industry. And I think um, Johnny Briggs's comments about um, mistakes may be made, but viewing them as a, as a through a positive lens of, of um, providing opportunity for education and, and development 
is a good example of um, you know, a proactive approach. Yeah. All right. Um, and anything that would in I can play, I think everyone has a few of these moments where they might think, oh, was that the most safe thing that I've ever done? And particularly for myself, um, becoming a pharmacist was something that I now have to, there are lots of moments that have come up and I'm like, oh, being taught how to be a pharmacist maybe has taught me some bad habits or some ways of being that maybe I need to unlearn or think about differently. And so if we're going to shift the profession to more enabling them to reach that point of having the confidence to say, maybe something's going on here, how do I reach out and learn more? Is there anything that you could share about what went really well or how you enabled people to start those conversations? Well, I think firstly, with the Guild's uh, clinical governance framework being embedded within the quality assurance program, QCPP, it's it's there in writing and it's a, requ it's a requirement that all pharmacies as they move through that assessment phase uh, have to meet. And I think that's flagging it as this is what is expected. Uh, it is a requirement of practice for a community pharmacy and you, that you, you need to have uh, to meet that requirement. And, and that's that flagging for anybody, including ourselves, that we need to, to do better. Uh, as, as in my little pharmacy group that I'm involved with, we need to do better. And certainly, uh, you know, in the early days, as a trying to be an interview pharmacist in country New South Wales, I was trying to create, um, you know, different services. And I still remember the moment where I realised that I needed to consider the patient's view on what services they might want to access and, and how I might design that. <laughs> and I, I chuckle in hindsight at my lack of you know, vision for what other others may think or may want, as opposed to me just you know, thinking I may perhaps not, not knew at all, but you know, knew the where I wanted to go and I hadn't considered other, the opinion of others, including our local Indigenous population. And I think you know, um, we all have those moments and, and it's how you learn and, and, and what you do going forward. Thank you for that. Um, on that theme of um, allowing people to reach that point of reflection or self-reflection or something like that. Um, I'm just going to head over to the universities and ask how, how is this brought into um, or being promoted in the curriculums and the pro programs that you've written? Um, so also another program at Griffith is 3121 Med. It's um, Aboriginal Health for Practice. So it's also in the health group. Routinely every year we have about 1,500 students do that, that course. Um, that's coming into pharmacy next year, isn't it, Fiona? Pharmacy is going to be doing it. At the moment, um, medicine and nursing and midwifery tend to do it. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, it goes from pre-invasion pre right up to current day. And it's all the policies that have impacted First Peoples along the way. Um, a lot of students have never learned this. They don't know half of this history, so it can be very um, shocking for them. Mm -hmm. And so we, the, all the lecturers in that are all First Peoples. We're all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander nurses mainly. Um, so from, from the very beginning right through to now, we support them. All the, all the assessments are around critical self-reflection, lifelong learning, how to make change, um, so there's that one. We also do social justice for first peoples. That's another course that a lot of the other allied health professionals do. And that, that also teaches the histories from pre-invasion to today. And then for a post-grad course we have is trauma integrated practice um, and healing. And that's done externally. Uh, we have an external partner to do that with We Are Lee, um, Aunty Judy Atkinson. Um, and that is also all, all the assessments are that about self-reflection. And we are developing with the First People's Health Unit a sort of fit for practice module with our new director, James Charles, who started, um, he's from South Australia, he's a Ghana man. Um, and we're looking at making that sort of um, for third and final year, final fourth year's um, course in First People's to keep that process going from the very beginning of university all the way to graduation. But that's our plan, so, yeah. Um, anything from UniSA? Yeah, thanks, Sue. I think um, what, what comes to mind 
um, when we talk about self-reflection and ensuring accountability is the position I uh, really work across is that it needs to occur within the team, within the teaching team to start with as well and have a think about and a, you know, a constant self-reflection upon their own cultural capabilities, not only as practitioners, but as educators as well, um, because the, uh, you know, the obvious flow on and subsequent effects it has on the curriculum and therefore the students that you're teaching as well. Um, and I think uh, for me personally, the position I'm in, the way I work with some of the programs around leading our um, UDRHs, uh, cultural education programs, is that there's no point introducing something new. Sometimes I only get to see students for maybe a three hour workshop on their final placement before they graduate. Um, you know, recently, the, you know, a couple of pharmacy students, but, uh, you know, the other week uh, with a group of podiatry and physio students are on their final placement rotations as well. So. Um, the position I take to it is I don't want to bring in anything new, like too new um, or too new concepts for them, but rather try and build upon their core curriculum as much as possible. And I really reinforce them is that you're taught, tell me, you tell me, what's this self-reflection you've taught about? What's this accountability, these skills that you hopefully get taught anyway? Let's bring them out and apply them mm -hmm. to these contexts. Um, and then hopefully what I'm contributing to that is that they have a further consideration for what their practice means uh, for working with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities, no matter where they go, you know, public, private, whatever. Um, but also the, the angle I, I really like to take to it is that use those skills you learn from uni and apply them beyond your professional lens. You're a human being at the end of the day. Education is such a privilege. And, um, you know, I'm passionate about mm -hmm. hopefully contributing to culturally responsive nurses and allied health professionals out there. But beyond that, you're people in our society. And I want, you know, if you're a part of my social group, my sporting club, whatever, I would want you to portray those similar cultural capabilities as well. So, yeah. 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 Thanks, Michael. I was just going to echo the same point is that it's not just, it's really how do they self-reflect and apply this wherever they're working in whatever role they have, whether it is as a citizen of society or as a, a pharmacist um, that they become. And, uh, you know, we've, got a couple of the students that, you know, participated, um, you know, with us today. And, and I'm hoping that they will apply that in other um, aspects of their um, professional life, but in also their personal life as well, because it's about integrating this learning and reflecting on that. Um, it's about the conversations you have with your peers and with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that you um, care for as part of your professional role as well. So I think self-reflection um, is, is such a key in the university program um, and it's the building on that skill and applying it in this context um, it is what is so important. Thanks, Elena, for the question. Yeah, no worries. I mean, I think that pharmacists have a lot of strengths they're taught a lot of really really great skills in their education that can be used and applied to different to different fields um, and part of that reflection is really leading to people to have a transformational moment which is well known in education and training how do you get people to actually reflect to the point where they might transform a, a long-held belief or way of seeing the world and I really just wanted to open that up out to people if they wanted to talk about how transformational change um, maybe looks like in students or um, how it's embedded to up, maybe get a few people to do one of those during the course. Um, I think um, when we talk about that, that sort of transformational change, it makes me think about those aha moments and uh, I guess what, what we know uh, anecdotally, but also from emerging literature around how students learn in this space is that everyone's on their own cultural journey at a different stage as well. Um, about the cultural immersion trip we shared upon some students uh, uh, attending that, they understand why they're there, why they're learning about it. Some understand how this is gonna to contribute to the clinical practice and other students are thinking, what am I doing here? I don't, I don't quite get it yet as well. And that's a, a, then a challenge for us to look internally as well how we can further prepare our students but um, I th think the point there is that everyone's on a, on a different journey there as well it's about ensuring that students uh, and I guess no matter what content they're coming across all have various ways of knowing being and doing and learning styles as well and so if we can um, 
I think I'm, I'm an advocate for if we can provide our students with as many learning opportunities um, using a variety of pedagogies and a variety of settings, you know, classroom on country and so on, that um, eventually that message will come across. And I know we've got a few students here as well, so that, you know, you're probably best positioned to, to comment on that and, and reflect upon that as well, so. Mm -hmm. Elena, so on behalf of the Guild, yeah, it's great to, to have universities and students represented. And, and what I would you know, challenge um, the, the student bodies coming out, Verity and Priyanka and others, is as you come out, you, you've had education that um, you know, previous pharmacy generations may not have had and, and experiences as well that, that we haven't. And yeah, the, the power in some ways is in your hands to, um, to, to take the lead uh, wherever you're working in, in our sector, uh, because yeah, you, you, it's, it's, it's current learning, uh, you're, you're on that journey already and you can help others. So yeah, as a community pharmacist, um, I, I have, uh, feel empowered by having students and interns and young pharmacists and, and their learnings can really um, uh, enlighten me uh, as an example. So uh, yeah, it's, um, the, the power of uh, the future is in our, our students' hands. I think too, it can be quite simple in terms of I watch when um, Kerry gets student, the MFARM students to tell their story and some of them have never really reflected on that and she has this great way of drawing connections between her and the students just from some really simple things and you just watch people starting to change their thinking and recognise that they're changing their thinking and it's just this really great, lovely thing to watch that you see them then wanting to be more respectfully curious is a term that we often use in terms mm -hmm. of learning about learning in themselves and others as well. Um, Caitlin, um, did you want to say something before? Is that right? Caitlin's one of our, uh, one of our pharmacy students. So I think she's keen to. Yeah, so I just wanted to share about how um, how great I thought the, the cultural immersion was and how important I thought learning about the, um, the yarning was because that's something that I hadn't really been exposed to before. So just learning how to communicate with Aboriginal and Torres Strait um, Islander people I thought was something that was really quite important, especially as, um, you know, talking about Western medicine to them was something that I found really quite beneficial during um, our time with Michael and um, Christian. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, we've had one more question in the chat around open source training packages for pharmacy students. Um, I'm happy to take that one on notice. We can have a look and, and get back to you. Um, something that there are a lot of people out there training in cultural safety. Um, so local is good. So if you know of someone or um, you have connections to someone, that would be my first step. Alrighty, so I might just wrap this up. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I had to do to prepare for this podcast. So one thing, I'm, I'm a Yugambeh woman, and so I speak words at home with my husband, but Today I'm presenting from Larrakia country and I actually didn't know any words to use from that place. So what I did about that was I rang the local Larrakia. I mean, I used Google, it, um, it worked. I got a couple of phone numbers. I found out where to go and I spoke to people and it was a really rewarding experience for me um, because I got to learn more about them and their language and how it works. And then we also started a conversation on cultural safety programs that had been happening in Darwin for um, health professionals and pharmacists. So, you know, it's all about making connections and just being um, open to maybe asking that you don't know or reaching out to someone that you've never reached out to before and following it up. I mean, I, I did have to follow it up and I had to tell them who I was and why I wanted to use this language. So that's just an aside. If anyone out there would like to include language, that's a way that you can go about doing it. So thank you all for joining me and Mamak from Larrakia country.